Hello and welcome to this Uni Taster On Demand event and also a big warm welcome to you if you're joining live. Today we're going to be looking at university courses in artificial intelligence. My name is John Sheik, I'm the founder and director of Uni Taster Days and I'm going to be hosting the event today and I'm joined by two exceptional speakers for this event. Professor Richard Harvey is joining us from the University of East Anglia and Dr Corvinda Panasala is joining us from the University of Bradford. Richard in a few moments is going to open things up and look at the reasons to consider artificial intelligence and also some application tips and the context to Richard finding application tips will be very, uh, very relevant when Richard introduced himself in just a second. And then Corvinda Panasa is joining us from Bradford and she's going to be talking about what to expect on the, the course from an academic perspective and also an overview of careers after an artificial intelligence course. With that, I'll pass please to our first speaker, Professor Richard Harvey, joining us from the University of East Anglia. Thank you, John. Uh, hello, everyone. Lovely to see you. Um, my name is Richard Harvey. I'm a professor of computer science at uh, good old uh, UEA. And um, a few words about me. Um, this is a smiling me. Uh, I work on problems in artificial intelligence at UEA. And I suppose if you look me up, you would find that I was best known for solving problems in lip reading and relating to computer vision. In fact, there's been a fierce contest over the last 10 years as to who is it, is it us or Oxford who produces the best lip reading system. E each thinks we're the best. Um, I have another couple of jobs. Uh, one is a, as a professor of, professor of information technology at Gresham College in London. Gresham College is the oldest public education body in the world, I think, dating from 1597. Uh, but more importantly, we have a YouTube channel and some of the stuff I'm going to refer to, you can find on that YouTube channel. So do have a look at that because that's, uh, we, we, you know, there's some good materials there. Uh, I suppose also a relevance is I'm the academic director of admissions at UEA. And I'm uh, in that role, I sit on the UCAS council. If you're interested in what I'm saying, I have a little blog and you can have a look on the website there, which has got some information about um, various things that I've been asked to comment on. Uh, for those of you who don't know, this is UEA on the left. I don't want to bore you with how brilliant the University of East Anglia is. Uh, both the universities presenting are, of course, super, super brilliant. And that's not what this is. is. I just wanted to point out uh, we're over on the right hand side uh, based in Norwich. And this is the map of UEA, which again, I don't want to dwell too much upon, but I do want to dwell more upon the map of the territory. And one of the interesting things about AI is where it sits. You know, it, people think of it as a fundamentally interdisciplinary subject. And um, this is my map of computer science and the map of AI. And um, it's important to point out there are probably quite a few maps that you could produce of um, AI because not shown here are elements of psychology and sociology and so on. Nevertheless, I think it is material that I see connections between all of these things. And I should point out that I'm a classical sort of person working in AI in the sense that I don't have a degree in AI. We didn't have those things. Um, I have a degree in um, engineering, and then I did my PhD in statistical estimation theory, uh, both of which are relevant to AI, but they're not the same as AI. So up, bot bottom left here in my slide are some of the things that you might associate with AI. And you'll hear these words used sometimes as if they're synonyms for artificial intelligence, and they're not really. Um, so machine learning is the business of making computers that can learn from data usually. And the fundamental thing about machine learning is it adapts to the data that it sees. Um, computer vision is building machines that can understand the visual world, often making use of machine learning, but not always. Uh, signal processing is our systems that deal with signals, often video signals. So computer vision could be seen as part of signal processing. Some people think it isn't, and some people think it is. Natural language processing is dealing with text and uh, the spoken word. Uh, Corvinda Panasar is talking later, I know is an expert on that area. And I've done a bit of work in that area as well. Robotics, I guess we can all uh, think about, although robotics isn't always what you think of. 
Um, we're running a program at the moment on agricultural robotics, for example. So people often think about humanoid robots, you know, killer robots, that sort of thing. Um, a robot might just be a, it might be a ship. It might be um, a tiny little thing with wheels looking at wheat and deciding whether it's time to crop the wheat at that time. And then uh, down the bottom here, um, last buzzword is chatbots. Well, they're just dialogue systems of, of many types. Now, the point about showing this rather complicated map of the whole of computer science is that there are interrelationships between all of these things. So for example, the modern um, buzz, which is about um, deep learning, for example. I mean, deep learning was made possible and is made popular by advancements in graphical processing units. Uh, without those, a lot of the common libraries that people use now really wouldn't be very practical, you know, because the, the thing about deep learning is it takes absolutely ages to, uh, to complete. So that's a good sort of lead in into thinking about, you know, what's hot and what's not in, uh, in AI. And um, this is one of our students actually programming some little model robots on, on his, uh, I think it's him, yeah, his, his knees in, uh, in one of the labs. And um, I thought I'd just sort of give you a quick run through some of the things that are sort of research interest at the moment in AI, because it will, it might sort of pique your interest and make you think a little bit about some of the things that you would like to be involved in. I mean, uh, this morning I was on a call that was all about um, ethics in AI. Um, so there are several problems with modern AI. For example, um, when you learn something, how do you know you're learning it fairly? That sounds, you know, sounds a bit trivial that, but for example, um, let me give you one that's running at the moment. A few years ago, it was discovered that the face recognition system that ran on a particular brand of uh, telephone, uh, mobile phone, uh, did not work as well for people of African-American origin as it did for Americans. Now, um, this was a big issue, particularly in America, which is a country that's obsessed with race, you know, absolutely obsessed with the topic. It was obviously a big, big thing, and it was caused a considerable surprise. Uh, so this has led to a, quite a lot of research interest in bias and fairness. In fact, there's a, a bias and fairness toolkit that you can download from at least one uh, manufacturer to look at that. Um, there are legal issues in AI, which we were discussing yesterday. Um, when you're hit by an autonomous vehicle, what happens? Um, who pays and who is liable if there's an accident with an autonomous vehicle? And all of those lead into a sort of general societal interest in AI. I mean, I've been working in this field for a long time and I've never known a time when I've been asked to give so many talks about the legal, ethical, and indeed uh, sociological impacts of AI. Uh, for example, quite a simple thing, which is who, whose job will be safe as a result of AI? Even that is a subject of some dispute and interest at the moment, a rather fascinating thought. Some people think that AI is special and it will affect a completely new range of jobs. And other people think, no, no, it's, it's just like automation and any of the jobs that are conventionally automated will indeed be easily automated. So that's one area of interest that's emerging out of AI. And it doesn't really fit into a computer science syllabus, that, that aspect, I think it's fair to say. Um, so that's something to bear in mind. Um, the other uh, area of sort of current interest isn't really sociological, it's just technical. And just to pick some things out that you may have spotted in the headlines recently, um, did you all notice um, DeepMind had just announced a new innovation on protein folding? Okay, so DeepMind is a company that was set up in London, British company, bought by Google for some enormous amount of money. And their, their big uh, trick, if you like, was to learn how to play games. So um, one of their uh, tremendous uh, achievements was to learn to play the game of Go. The game of Go is very popular in um, East Asia and uh, it's of China, Korea, Japan, and so on. And um, uh, there's a wonderful video about AlphaGo, which was their, uh, their approach to do this on, on, uh, on YouTube. I thoroughly recommend having a look at it. 
And what was impressive about that system was it learned the rules of Go from scratch, just like a human. Well, they've now been working on protein folding problems. And the problem of protein folding is given a list of uh, amino acids, what shape do they uh, make as they, uh, as they slot together? That's important because uh, a lot of uh, diseases, particularly genetic diseases, can be solved if you know what the effect of um, molecules, protein molecules is in, on the body and that the effect of protein molecules is largely related to their shape. So um, that paper came out in Nature a few weeks ago and was rather fascinating. Um, and I'll just pick one other that I thought was rather interesting recently. Um, okay, so this is a picture um, that sold recently in um, New York, I think. And I'm trying to remember how much it sold for. I think I was wise enough to write it on the slide. Yeah, $425,000. Um, it's a, called a picture of portrait of Edmund Bellamy. It was produced by an artistic collective in Paris. The estimate was about $16,000. So it, it sold for a lot more than his estimate. What was interesting about it to me and to a lot of people was um, this picture wasn't painted. It was... Um, created by an artificial intelligence. It was created by a system known as a gen uh, generative adversarial network or a GAN. Um, and I probably haven't got a long, long enough to explain how GANs work, um, but there is a lecture on YouTube about it from me if you're interested. And this is, I, I think what's so fascinating about this is of course there have been AI artworks before, you know, that's not very new, but they're now beginning to look quite good and they're generating serious artistic interest. So all of which was perhaps a long way of saying, what a fantastic time to want to study AI because society has finally got it. It's gone from being, in my lifetime, it was a sort of, I don't know, a very sort of arcane and minor um, activity suitable for boffins and boys and girls in white coats. And now it's become a lot more mainstream and a lot more interesting, I think it's fair to say, to employers and others. So um, I just picked some of the uh, employment titles that came out of our uh, final year last year, and I picked some of their employers. And you can see they're quite wide ranging, aren't they? Um, so the one down the bottom is the one that UEA has the closest link with, which is Apple, who sponsor quite a lot of our work. But uh, technical director of IBM is a colleague of mine who was a graduate at uh, UEA. These big employers are interesting, you know, they because they tend to set the market a bit in what they're looking for in skills. And they also tend to set the market in salaries, which can be really quite substantial. And all of these people, and I could have written, you know, another hundred on the slide easily, are looking, as far as I can tell, they are definitely looking for the skills that people who are well-trained in the techniques of artificial intelligence have. There's no question about that. So I've sort of answered, I think, one of the first questions in why study AI, which is a very sort of venal question, but it's worth just chalking it up there, which is money. You know. These skills are in demand and people are prepared to pay big money for them. In fact, I worked out somewhat to my shame that every single graduate student who has graduated from my lab in the last uh, th three years, I think, now earns more than I do. And professors aren't exactly underpaid, so um, it's highly remunerative, that's for sure. I think there's a second region, which is the economy and society needs people who know about these things. And you can look at that on both sides. You can look at it from a sort of potential, which is what I tend to look at. I see AI as providing tremendous potential for society, but you can also look at it in a negative, which is there are numerous cases throughout the press of um, misunderstandings of ethical positions in AI. And those misunderstandings probably arise, I think, from a shallow knowledge of AI rather than a deep knowledge, which is what society needs. And I'd also point out that it's a nice thing to do socially. You know, computer science certainly, which is the, uh, the portfolio in which AI usually sits, is highly diverse and full of lots of interesting 
uh, people, many from overseas. Uh, I think I've missed something out on this slide, but I hope it's sort of evident from the way I'm talking, which is the real reason to study AI, of course, is because it's jolly interesting, you know, no question about that. Now then, what about getting in? Okay, well, there's, there's, there aren't that many degrees which are labeled purely as AI in the UK. And the reason for that is that employers mostly employers, but also applicants to a certain extent, particularly those from independent schools, are incredibly conservative about the sort of things they study. And um, I haven't really got time to go into why that is, um, but it, it is like it is. And um, to, to add a bit of sort of flesh to it, I, I wrote a little blog on why people are conservative and why their choices are like, like they are. But if we just look at computer science and many computer science courses, not all, but many computer science courses will contain AI in it, then I counted over a thousand choices. So the first thing you need to do is to have, be systematic about making your choice. You need to think, well, you know, um, and that, that list that you should construct should be to you. So I remember when I did it, I was, um, let me pick something that isn't very embarrassing. There are a number of things that weren't embarrassing on my list, but um, I, I was a very good swimmer when I was a kid. So I, I had a short list of engineering programs in my case, but I must, I really wanted to go to somewhere that had an Olympic sized swimming pool. So there you go, that was a, that was a great choice because it immediately eliminated the choice down to a, a few set, uh, a, a set of a small number. And that was a big help. So I'd certainly recommend doing something like that. Now, in terms of AI sort of admissions and skills, there is a bit of a dilemma here, I think. Um, and it goes, it goes like this, which is, we all know that the skills you require to be good at AI are probably numerate skills, and probably the ability to program a computer. People say, well, you don't need to program a computer to do AI. And that's probably true. But I think if you're going to be any good at it, you need to be able to do that. And that those skills tend to align with the skills required for computer science courses, which is why a lot of AI tends to sit in the computer science portfolio. I did look quite closely and I was looking for some that didn't, but I, I didn't really find any. So I think that's, it's fair to say that if you're going to be admitted to an AI course, then you ought to be offering some sort of mathematical uh, or numerate ability. I don't want you to get freaked out about this. It's not essential that it's really amazing. You know, we're used to in AI, which has been taught in this country for, you know, 40 or 50 years uh, as a separate discipline. Um, we're used to people coming from a variety of backgrounds. And I think the admissions tutors in our field are particularly open-minded. Uh, but if you have a choice of what to offer, then I'd certainly recommend uh, you know, one of the standard numerate subjects, com computer science, mathematics, uh, physics, that sort of thing would suit uh, you. And that is indeed what most universities would say they require. Um, on my blog, I explain why there's a slight dilemma. And the slight dilemma is that when you ask employers whether they want students with AI degrees, they have a tendency to say no. Okay, at least from the survey, a short survey I did of people when preparing for this talk. When you ask them, do they want uh, employees who know about AI? They say yes, very much. So employers have this inherent conservatism on choosing degrees, as do certain subjects, which tends to mean people often choose a computer science degree with an AI component. Both are fine. I think the most important thing is to choose something that you find interesting and motivates you. And that's probably quite a good point to stop and probably quite a good point to introduce Corvinda, who is going to talk about what it actually means to study AI at university. Thank you.
Our next speaker today is Dr. Corvinda Panasar, who is joining us from the University of Bradford. Corvinda is a member of the, the academic team um, at Bradford, which is brilliant because she's going to be talking about what to expect when it comes to studying artificial, artificial intelligence and, and what to expect actually on the course. And the second part of Corvinda's session is going to look at careers as well when it comes to artificial intelligence. With that, I'll pass things straight over to you, Corvinda. Over to you. Hello and welcome. Thank you so much, John and Richard, for, uh, for introducing me. I'm Dr. Corvinda Panasa and I'm a, I'm a techie. I've had an exciting career journey from seeing the internet um, evolve, creating smart solutions to AI powered solutions. My, my research interest is, um, is to make chatbots more smarter, more intelligent and, be able, and to be able to understand. Now, I will, in this talk, I will unpack and explain uh, a couple of use cases and I will look at uh, what to expect from an applied AI course and also some of the careers in AI. AI is, uh, has impact. It's powerful. It's everywhere. It's touching our lives every day from your Netflix recommendations to, um, to your social media feeds to you using your uh, face as a biometric method to unlock your phone to catching an Uber. So what I want to try and do is now uh, look at a, a couple of uh, what we call success stories in, his in history. So I'm going to take the first one. So what we have is in 1997, we had um, a test tournament between IBM's deep computer, a deep blue computer. And it, that was against the world-class chess champion, Gary Kasparov. Now, deep blue computer won that chess tournament. The second example is malicious software on your computer, malware. And the third one is being able to recognize faces and people in photographs on your smartphone apps. Now, what we have in all those three examples are a sign that AI is catching up to human intelligence. Now, the definition that we have there, AI is the science and engineering of making intelligent machines. So what I want to do now is let's just tap into some, a couple of more examples um, to look at these more recent use cases. I'm going to take football. Now, Richard talked a lot about uh, mentioned vision. So here we have an example of Marcus Rashford and a football. So computer vision has been able to detect two objects here, and one object has one object has um, two objects. And what we can see there is a case of of a whole set of tags which are associated with that image. And what we have is that this example here, a tag, a man with a football on a field with a confidence level and a probability of 0.92, etc. So here you've got some algorithms which are used in the background. Now, what I'm going to show you next is another video without any volume, but what we will see here is an example of real world real time video analytics. And the video will start now. So what you will see here, uh, there's loads and loads of uh, annotations on this video. Uh, what you will see here is that you can see the team and the player behavior. You can see the analytics which are going on in the background. You can see the distance between the players. You can see all sorts of tagging which is going on. Um, there's various predictions which are going to be made as part, uh, as you can see uh, with the annotations on top. And, and on top of that, the video has 30 frames per second, which means um, you've got an enormous, uh, a phenomenal amount of actionable insights. And as you can see here, this is the best part of the video where it's predicting where the player may score that goal. So more about football. 
Okay, so the next another area is natural language processing. So we are looking at text. And here I have got an example of a FIFA 19. There's 18,208 players and their data and they have and 89 pieces of information about them. And here we have Messi at the top with an overall performance score of 94. Now, what we want to know is uh, insights. So if we look at um, on the next slide, if we look at the next slide here, we want to know about what's happening, um, particularly about how the player is uh, the player's behavior, their features. Now, um, the image is not so great, uh, but if we were to look at this correlation heat map, and what we see is that there's a, there's a correlation between uh, dribbling and ball control at 0.94, which logically we know that exists, but it, as a granular level piece of level uh, and prediction, it's very, very important. And the second image that we have is that in the range of 30 to 35, our players are performing so much, players are performing so much better. And as you can see with the overall, uh, sorry, players with who play with their left foot are performing, um, have, all, have, have got relatively higher overall performance scores. And what's also interesting is the category of 40 to 45. What you interesting is that these players uh, are predominantly have used their right foot. Now, these are examples of of, of visualizations and analytical information that can help with decision making. And obviously, for, you know, when it comes to football transfers, this is a multi million pound business. So, this sort of analysis and actionable insight is absolutely crucial. Next, I will move on. So here we have an example of a social distancing detector. What we have is this bird's eye view, which at this moment in time, you can see that there's two red dots, which shows that those two people are in fact um, very close together. And this was created by Andrew Ng's new latest startup. Now, here we have computer vision, we have machine, we have machine vision, um, computer vision, we have AI models which are at play, and we have a whole set of uh, this data can be used for all sorts of different purposes later on. Moving on, uh, this is um, an example of an AI powered robot sorter, which can learn how to which can learn how to um, see the difference between plastic and card. It's got seven, it uses its arms, seven degrees of freedom, and it can be able to pick out the right products um, using a whole set of AI models. Now, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, University of Bradford's research professor, Hassan Yugel. He's part of our course team, Applied AI course team, and he has looked at head and, head and neck tumors. And he has also looked at face recognition and an image and analysis of uh, the difference between male and female smiles. Uh, there's a lot more, uh, there's also other news, other news uh, where University of Bradford has, um, has talked about their research. Next, what we have is from my colleague, uh, Dr. Irfan Mahmood. He has looked at brain, he has looked at computer aided diagnosis and brain MRIs. Now, these will normally go to the doctor. Uh, what uh, Dr. Irfan has done has has used AI models to look at the curvature, the edges, um, the motion intensity, the color contrast as well, and been able to, um, in that heat map, you can see that red section, which shows the abnormality of um, in, that, um, in that brain. And the second example is border control. You've got You've got fences, people climbing over fences. The heat map is obviously identifying a person there. The next example we've got is AI in agriculture. And what we have is this uh, drone assisted um, image um, uh, decision uh, detection, uh, d d disease detection um, example. So we've got a sort of like a, a zoom, a, a, a zoomed in view. And what we can see are those patches. There's a green patch which ha highlights healthy radish fields. And alternatively, we've got the other patches to represent uh, those which are not so healthy. So 
not we have next so what i've shown you with those examples are what we call the branches of ai uh, richard previously talked about these so we have computer vision we've talked a lot about that we've got natural language processing from your twitter sentiment analysis to machine translation to your um to your voice um as well um uh, yeah, voice activated devices, we've got expert systems for uh, fraud detection, uh, for looking at malware, uh, we've got planning on organized optimization when it comes to all sorts of, you know, manufacturing plants and quality control, and then you have your robotics as well. Um, and then what we have is the natural language processing, we've got these branches, and then we've got the AI structure itself with machine learning, where it's learning about data over, it's improvements performance increases more over time and then your deep learning where it's it's got its architecture and it's it's learning without any implicit instructions so what i want to show you now um we'll talk about now so we've talked about the ai itself the use cases some of those examples but our course what can you expect so our course is unique in that you will you will develop solutions which are starting from simple to complex um those real applications uh will Will, um, will could be associated with with some of our different departments that we have. For instance, we've got uh, health sciences, we've got social sciences, businesses, archaeology. Uh, so those projects could be those 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 problems could be any will be will be will be start from year one right through year three, and they will be using the the concept of what we call scaffolding projects. And obviously, you will have all sorts of uh, AI techniques and frameworks that will be delivered on a project basis. Now, what is really important is that uh, in the second year of your course, you have done interdisciplinary work where you could actually work on projects related with the media and design and technology and their creative, creative technologies. You could do some work with virtual reality and similarly on your year, year three. And as part of your final year project, you alongside that you have a professional portfolio uh, all about your graduate employability and how you will um, be able to be ready uh, for, uh, for um, the wide world. Now, what you have is an opportunity of pitching your project uh, as well. Now, what is really, really important here is that you could be from a computing, you could be from an engineering background, a science and design background. And the main thing is that you would be interested about technology of today and curious about the technologies of the future. So what I want to do now is I want to try and put everything together on from this, uh, from my previous sort of use cases. Uh, we have those six branches of comet, rich branches of AI. And as part of your, what as part of the degree, what you would have done was worked on various tasks and projects, which would have initially started across all, possibly all, some or two or three of those six branches of AI. Uh, but the main thing to realize is that your final year project will pick one or two of these and similarly you'll have those technical skills you will have your soft skills which are which are what you call what what we call Forbes calls your unique human capabilities that robots or uh, haven't quite reached yet yeah as we have seen um, and you have your project experience um, which will lead you to a role now what i've done in the middle here is listed a set of artificial intelligence specific roles so say if you spent a lot of time uh, on your final year project with some data and engineering work or computer vision work you did some work on 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 face recognition or motions um, so you would look for those particular roles which are computer vision or you would look for the robotic you would look for the ai consultancy or the ai engineer now in that list that i show you there there's a whole host of different roles. There's what you call technology oriented roles as well. There's business intelligence developer roles where you could be an AI person who knows about um, the in intelligence and organizational learning that will also take the take AI from the BI role to the AI role. It's almost like a next graduation of it. Now, what I also show in the third column is what we call the generic technical roles. Now, these ones are where 
where it's advertised as computer science, uh, but then what they're looking for is you having your AI specialism. Now, as you can see, you've got computer scientist, developer, software engineer, technical consultant, you've got project manager and research scientist as well. Now, these computer science and AI, there's a high degree of transferable skills. And that is really, really important to, to understand. Now, I was looking at indeed.com yesterday and there were 759 computer science jobs and 109 AI jobs. Now, these are going to change in the, in the near future. And the reason is the World Economic Forum has have said that AI, um, COVID, the industrial 4.0 revolution we're in, we've got smart computing, we've got Internet of Things. Um, AI, is AI has so much potential that there'll be a lot more AI investment, a lot more AI inspired investment as well. Um, that would mean that uh, there's going to be new, there's going to be new digital jobs coming out, about 133 million is what they've quoted, but there's going to be a lot of decline of non-digital jobs as well. So the picture on the AI scene uh, will actually be very, very different. Now, just to also iterate that the, the, the AI specific roles are normally coming out of your larger companies or your niche organizations or your startups. Um, and you know, the computer science roles will come from those which do not fit that category. So these roles have a lot, there's a lot of, as Richard said earlier on, um, there's a lot of commonality between computer science and AI, but AI has its applied, it's got its specialism and AI as and its technologies are so powerful um, and impactful that um, that's this is this is what uh, this is the way forward with applied AI. Now, just to end, here we have my course team: Professor Hassan Yigel, uh, myself, and Dr. Irfan Mahmood, and. Our BSc Honours Applied AI course, uh, like I said earlier on, it's a unique course and it will help in, in tackling uh, some of those, um, the gap and the need at the current moment. I hope that's been useful and some things have been clarified. Thank you.